Hey, Singapore. Yeah? Hey, come here, come here, all right? Meet Rwanda. Come on in. Shake hands. This guy's trying to be the African version of you. It's time to learn geography. Now! Hey, everyone, I'm your host, Barbs. If there was ever a comeback kid story, Rwanda would probably fit the bill. Oh, and just a heads up. Hey, guys, this is my buddy Edmund. He's Rwandan. He will be popping in and out of this episode. Hey, that's me. I'll see you guys in a minute. Thank you, Edmund. And with that being said, let's jump into the globe, shall we? Now, Rwanda is starting to make the news a lot these days. Few countries actually have a socioeconomic success story as them, and things are only starting to look brighter. But first, let's look at this little gem of a nation, shall we? The country is just below the equator and is surrounded by four other countries, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Tanzania, and Burundi, and Lake Kivu to the west, which they share with the DRC. However, the DRC gets the big island, Idri, in the middle of it. To the south, the only territorial dispute they kind of have with Burundi is this two square kilometer patch of land, known Known as Sabanerwa. Reason being because the Akanyaru Kanyaru River shifted its course southwards after heavy rains in 1965. No one really pays attention to this though. The capital of the country is Kigali, located near the exact geographic center of the country, and from there the country is further divided into five provinces or Intara, north, south, east, and west, and Kigali, which has its own provincial status. Kigali, of course, is the largest city with over one million people, and it also holds the largest and busiest airport, Rwanda Kigali International. However, just to skip south, Bugesera International airport is actually currently marked to become the biggest and busiest airport servicing the greater Kigali area, as Kigali airport has been reaching maximum capacity in the past few years. From there, they have only one other international airport, Kamembe International, located in the western province, close to Lake Kivu, on the border of the DRC. The country has a wide network of paved roads that reach virtually every corner of the country, and every main town and city, but essentially all roads kind of stem off of Kigali. Since the country is small and landlocked, they don't have any major industrial shipping ports, and almost all cargo from abroad must be brought in from the port of Mombasa in Kenya or Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Which is interesting because funny side note, Rwanda is part of the EAC or East African Community, an international government organization that acts much like a trade block and customs union between six countries. Talks have been made by a committee in proposing a huge mega state called the East African Federation in which all six would potentially become one country, but so far the idea is still in the works. But who knows? Also, weirdly enough, Rwanda is one of the few countries that joined the Commonwealth of Nations that never had a history of being colonized by the British. Anyway, according to the World Bank, Rwanda was titled the most competitive economy in the African continent as well as the easiest place to do business in Africa. In fact, over two billion has been funded by the African Development Bank to construct Kigali Innovation City, which consists of world-class universities, technology companies, biotech firms, and commercial centers providing over 50,000 jobs. Around 95% of the youth are enrolled in schools and literacy rates have jumped from only about 58% in 1991 to nearly 75% today. How did all this happen? though. Well, basically, in the year 2000, they had this thing called the Vision 2020, and it was like, okay, guys, we literally just had a genocide, and we had to fix things up in our country. Let's get it all done in 20 years. What do we need? We need to rebuild all the lost homes and fix the infrastructure. We need to address the past atrocities and provide social services. We need to clean up all the mess on the streets. Okay, well, we don't have many resources. We are incredibly dense with population and we have a limited budget. What are some cost-efficient methods we could implement? Uh, divert about 22% of budget funds into the education sector and construct government subsidized neighborhoods for families that lost homes. Let's do the local communal justice system to put the two million cases on trial. Let's do Umugando in Kigali where everybody has to volunteer to clean up everything. Oh yeah! Also, let's make the first and third Sunday of the month a car-free day. Oh, great idea. What if on that day you could get free checkups from doctors? And hold free open concerts in public. And after that, let's ban plastic bags. Like, visitors will get their luggage checked at the airport. Yeah, those are all real things. To this day, Kigali is labeled the cleanest city in Africa. They're making a statement, and it might really make you raw want to see it. <laughs> And speaking of visiting, if you do, here's a list of some of the top notable sites you guys, the Rwandan geography people, suggested I mention. Kigali has a lot of genocide memorial sites. Camp Kigali Belgian Monument, the Hotel de Mil Colin, the Ethnographic Museum in Butare, the National Art Gallery in Nyanza, Nyungwe and Butare both have royal palaces, the National University, the Cultural Heritage Corridor, Ibiwachu Culture Center, Ntarama Church, the Congo Nile Trail, the Pufunda Tea Factory, Musanze Caves, the Kuruhimbi Milk Bar, the Beach on Lake Kivu, Ruhengeri and Gisenya are really cool towns, and probably the most notable spot, Volcanoes National Park, which has an incredibly rare animal that we will discuss in the next section. The... 
Rwanda is often called the land of a thousand hills. It's small, only about the size of Haiti or Albania, yet there's a lot going on based off of its interesting geographic location. Although small, Rwanda sits on a very important geological zone known as the East African Rift. We've talked about this guy many times. Basically, the crack starts in the Red Sea, splitting all the way down into the Great Lakes, which were subsequently formed by this rift system. Rwanda sits on the Albertine Rift, the western crack section of the East African Rift, right next to Lake Kivu, one of the smaller lakes, but the largest of the country, which by the way, has methane extraction rigs. As the country sits on a fault line, this makes part of the country partially geothermal as the surrounding areas have multiple volcanoes, some dormant, some active. The largest lake entirely within Rwanda though would be Lake Ihema on the east side of the country in the Akagera National Park. There are two other national parks, the Nyungwe Forest National Park in the west and the famous Volcanoes National Park in the north. Nearby the Volcanoes National Park, you can find the tallest peak of the country, Mount Karisimbi, a dormant volcano, which is part of the larger Virunga mountain chain that covers much of the west side of the country. This is home to the famous eight volcanoes of the Virunga Mountains, and Rwanda has five of them. If you zoom out a little further, you can see that Rwanda is split between two main watershed basins, the Nile Basin, where about 80% of the water drains, and the Congo Basin, where about 20% drains. The longest river of the country is the Kagera, which makes the border with Tanzania. However, the longest river entirely within Rwanda is the Nyabarongo, which hooks into the Mogo River, and many say these waters could be some of the most distant sources of the Greater Nile River that flows into Egypt. Yeah, the country is small, but it has a lot of natural features and landscapes to work with. I mean, coffee is a huge industry out here. And speaking of coffee, it's time for my triple shot espresso break, which means Noah comes in for this segment. Hey! Player defeated. Right. Rwanda is quite small, but it sits at the relatively high elevation. This means, thanks to the location in a tropic zone along a fault line with volcanic soil close to the equator, Rwanda has the perfect climate and land to produce crops. It also means you'll find the occasional hot spring here and there. And keep in mind, after war and genocide times, much of the country was in need of recovery. They once implemented a one cow per family program called Girinka back in 2006. It was like, okay, we're left with a ton of impoverished and malnourished rural people. How do we help them? The the cow is a huge symbol of livelihood in our country. Cows give milk, meat, clothing. Let's give everyone a cow. Okay, but how do we do that? How about we start buying off a bunch of them to distribute to some registered applicants. From there, the first female calf born from that cow must be given to another impoverished family. And the cycle continues. The cycle continues. And since the program was implemented, the quality of life in Rwanda has increased and the life expectancy has risen by nearly 20 years since the mid-90s after the genocide. And today, about 87% of the population have health insurance compared to less than 40% in 2008. One of the biggest draws to Rwanda is that it is one of the only two main safe places for people to go and see the incredibly rare mountain gorillas at Volcanoes National Park. Rwanda has the largest population of the animals at about 200 and they are heavily protected. And speaking of animals, here's our resident animal expert to explain. Hey there guys, it's Gary Harlow here. In Rwanda, basically, the east has more savanna species and the west has more jungle species. In the east, you can find things like like hippos, elephants, black rhinoceri. Whereas in the west, you find more primates and birds like blue and gold monkeys, great blue ta tacos, bush, <laughs> great blue tacos, great blue terracos, bush babies, baboons, and of course, the mountain gorilla. Nonetheless, the national animal is actually the leopard. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, you're welcome, mate. And that just about does it, so now we finish off this segment like we always do. Food! Like many other East African countries, a staple found in many dishes is ugali or ubugali, a ball made of mashed maize. Most people only eat meat a few times a month, and most meals are high in vegetables, carbs, and in some groups, milk. Some notable dishes include amateke, ibihaza, inkiniga, imizuzu, isumbe. In the areas by Lake Kivu, you might find some good Nile tilapia. And disputedly, the national, if not a very common dish, Ibitoki. Also, Uruguagua banana wine is a popular drink, but out of all drinks, milk is probably the favorite. Cows are once again very important to Rwandans. They even rent them out for wedding ceremonies. But that's a cultural fact, which means we now move on to... Thank you, Noah. Hi-ho, Tungsten. Now, at this point, we've talked a lot about Rwanda's prosperity and social progress. However, this is where things get a little heavy. Rwanda has a pretty intense story that everything came out of. But first, the demographics graph. The country has about 11.5 million people and is the second most densely populated country in Africa after Mauritius and ranks in the top three least corrupt countries in Africa. Now, nearly the entire country of Rwanda falls under the broader people group known as the Banyarwanda, part of the Bantu ethno-linguistic family. Most people in the country will just say that they are Rwandan and don't really prefer to establish 
establish the specific people group that they come from, but estimates state that somewhere around 83% of the country is from the larger Hutu tribe, and about 15% are from the smaller Tutsi tribe. From there, the smallest 1% are from the Twa. The remaining 1% are all other groups, mostly other Africans and a few whites and Asians that have moved in. They use the Rwandan franc as their currency, they use the type CNJ plug outlets, and they drive on the right side of the road. Now again, just like we explained in Rwanda's twin country Burundi's episode a long time ago, wow, that was a long time ago, even though they are seen as the same people and labels are not really preferred, if they must talk about it, most people will mention whether they have a background in the Hutu or Tutsi tribes. Here's Edmund explaining why these two tribes are a big deal in Rwanda. Okay, so the Hutus and Tutsis used to be a class. Uh, so the Tutsis were usually the ones with more cows, and then the Hutus were the serving class until after the colonization time when it became pretty much became an identity people were given identity cards where it said whether they were Hutus or Tutsis and the conflict started from there. They're, we're basically the same people. We speak the same language. Sometimes people say we're like kind of like physically a little bit different, but it's all pretty much the same. Thank you, Edmund. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I mean, most ethnographers agree that Tutsi and Hutu groups cannot even be properly called distinct ethnic groups. For what it's worth though, Rwanda has four official languages, English, French, Swahili, and the native national language, Kinyar Rwanda, which is weird because Rwanda was never even colonized by the British. So how did English become official? Well, it was kind of like this. <laughs> Mes amis, on doit partir maintenant. Il y a une révolution et c'est trop dangereux pour nous. Mais vous pouvez aller. On va rester en Uganda. Ugh. Actually, Paul, if you really want to be accurate, they'll be speaking Kenya Rwanda, not French. Ugh. Fine, Edmund, let's do this skit all over again. Yemwe nchute, reke du hunge, intambara ira tangie. Du hunge, hey, hey, hey. Reke du hunge, re, ibuganda. We're back, and we brought some of that Ugandan English with us. Yeah. Okay, putting the whole grazing near boundaries of what is acceptable contextualized humor based on historical incidents aside, that's basically how English entered Rwanda, mostly through returning Tutsi refugees that had lived nearly three decades in Uganda. In any case, Rwanda is also unfortunately known best by the biggest scar they suffered in history, the infamous Rwandan genocide. I'm gonna let Edmund explain this one because this is something he knows. The story of the genocide is like, it goes back into the 50s. That's when uh, the Hutus really started slowly killing the Tutsis and then some families started escaping and then in 1994 the plan of the president was shut down at the time and then that day that's when the genocide really started but it was something that built up from this 50s I was there and a lot of my neighbors like started getting killed some family members that day. I'm very lucky that I survived. So it ended when the RPF defeated our army and that pretty much ended the genocide. Yeah, in about 100 days, somewhere around half a million to a million Tutsis and moderate Tutsi sympathizing Hutus and even some Twas were targeted for slaughter by order of various Hutu military and police leaders. It's estimated about a quarter million to half a million women were also raped and attacked with crude killing techniques. In the end, Rwanda lost somewhere around 70% of its former Tutsi population. Moving forward in the right direction is taken very seriously. Today there are two national holidays commemorating the horrible incident. Denying or historically revising the genocide story is a criminal offense. In any case, that's the most intense part of this episode. Now let's move towards some culture stuff. What exactly is a Rwandan? Well, Random Hannah is back and she will explain. All right, good to be back. So putting all the heavy incidents we mentioned aside, if we had to summarize the distinction between the three main groups, essentially, the Tutsi were affiliated with cattle, the Hutu with farms, and the Twa with forest. Ethnographers speculate that the Twa, a pygmy people group noted for their average shorter stature, are possibly the oldest surviving population of the Great Lakes region. They live and thrive in forest areas, trading things like hunting meats and their famous Twa pottery. Also, Rwanda actually had a monarchy for the longest time until it was ousted in 1961. Even if you are a city slicker with no farm, cows still play a huge traditional role, and during weddings, everyone still follows the gusaba or dowry tradition of giving away a cow. Sometimes people will just rent a cow for the ceremony and give cash after. Everybody gets a cow? Somebody can send me a cow. That'd be cool, okay. Not really. I wouldn't have anywhere to put it. And it's not uncommon for people to have huge extended families. That's right. I'm actually the youngest of six. Oh, seven. 
I'm the seventh. <laughs> now we did mention that Rwanda's education sector has been booming. However, with the limited space, resources, and dense population, this kind of inadvertently caused an influx of overqualified citizens that may or may not easily find jobs within their field of study. One thing that has been filled job-wise though would be the national legislature, with about 65% of its seats filled by women. Faith-wise, the country allows freedom of religion, and the divide is nearly equal between Catholics and Protestants. Rwandans are world renowned for their arts and crafts. Often you'll see grass woven baskets and bowls like this thing here, known as an agasake, as well as this thing, an imigongo or cow dung art piece. After it dries, it's totally fine and doesn't even smell. And finally, one fun side fact, Rwandans of higher status were historically known for their amasunzu hairstyles. The practice was common all the way up until the start of the 20th century. Another thing you will see often at festivals are the intore dancers with their long blonde sisal fiber headpieces that whip around while they dance. But that is a topic that has to be covered in the music section, which means uh, the real life Florida man himself is back. Why, yes, Hannah, I'm Florida man. By the way, Rush is my favorite pan. Rest in peace, Neil Peart. That's my commentary. Please don't sue us because, you know, fair use and all that stuff. Anyway, as mentioned, the Intore or the Heroes Dance and the Ikinimba are probably the most famous male musical performers in all of Rwanda. Otherwise, for women, the Umo Shagirairo or Cattle Dance performed by women is the most common and popular show dance. Traditional music in Rwanda, sometimes called Gakondo, is unique in that it often follows a 5-8 rhythm, counted as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and traditional instruments are typically used like these things right here. Apart from that, modern music in Rwanda has made a huge rebound since the early 2000s, mostly in genres like hip-hop, R&B, gospel, and East African Afrobeat. Jean-Paul Samputu probably being one of the top notable figures. Today, the industry is growing and huge festivals like Kigali Up have started, and even reality singing competition shows like like Primus Guma Guma Superstar. And thank you, Keith. And now it's time to do the incredibly condensed history section of Rwanda. Early Iron Age, hunter-gatherer peoples, Bantu migration, Hutu and Tutsis come in, small tribal kingdom era, kingdom of Rwanda ruled by a Tutsi king. This king conquers more land and gives preference to the Tutsi. This British guy is the first European to visit. Germans come in, Belgians come in. They join it with Burundi and what is called Rwanda Urundi. Tribal identity cards are started, Hutu manifesto, monarchy is abolished, independence from Belgium, Rwandan civil war, Arusha accords, Rwandan genocide, RPF fights back, takes over, Paul Kagame they voted in, people love him, country starts to grow and recover, it downsized 12 provinces to 5, they joined the Commonwealth of Nations, Paul Kagame is still president that people love, but it's getting kind of shady because the government just kind of decided to allow unlimited terms, which makes a few people anxious, but so far the guy is still cool, but it's still like, let's keep our eyes on the situation. And here we are today! And with that, here are some notable Rwandans throughout history that you guys, the Rwandan geography peeps, and Edmund of course suggested we mention. Jacqueline Mukosonera, Paul Rusesa Bagina, Andre Sibomana, Ora Karuhimbi, Nchuti Gatwa, Konye, Frank Ntilikina, Tom Close, Noles, Cecil Karibwa, Gael Fai, Strome is half Rwandan, a bunch of athletes, football players, and Olympic athletes like these, Agnes Binaguaho, Miss France 2000 was half Rwandan, this director and actress, and Rose Kabuye. Yeah, lots of notable people have come out of the ashes and helped put Rwanda in the world stage. And speaking of the world stage, that brings us to... Rwanda definitely has a story riddled in tribulation and triumph, and in that story, many other key figures around the world played a role. For one, in Europe, Belgium is a weird one. Lots of Rwandans have families in Belgium, as the former colonizer had ties and moved people around, and the Belgian people tend to visit Rwanda often. However, the governments really don't pay too much attention to each other, and today the relationship is just kind of okay. The USA and China, of course, are also heavy investors. The USA is the largest contributor to the emergency plan for AIDS relief and the malaria initiative, and today many Rwandans also have moved to the USA, and with an influx of English education, it only makes things a little easier. China helps mostly by giving loans used to build roads and factories, and in 2007, a 160 million debt was cancelled. The closer friends would, of course, be the Great Lakes region in Africa. For one, Kenya and Tanzania have always been the cool big Swahili cousins. Many Rwandans either travel or have family in these countries, and much of Rwanda's economy is dependent on Tanzania and Kenya as they help with trade and business. For their best friends, depending on who you ask, 
Many Rwandans might say Burundi, Uganda, or the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uganda played a huge role in sheltering the refugees and influencing the generals that were exiled and would eventually fight back with the FPR or the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Uganda has usually played a role in supporting Rwanda since then and even after war times and today, the two are close. For the Democratic Republic of Congo, again, many fled and were refugees taken in after tensions rose. In the late 90s, there was a little bit of drama with the Rwandan-backed rebel groups that tried to overthrow Joseph Kabila until a ceasefire was installed. From there, the presidents met up in 2009 and reopened relations and opened embassies, and today there is a lot of cooperation between the two. And finally, we reach the closest, almost twin nation of Rwanda, Burundi. Burundi has almost the exact same story and culture as Rwanda. Both have Hutus and Tutsis, both were colonized by the same Germans and Belgians in the past, both have almost the same language, they even have similar sizes and population. Today, many families intermarry between the two countries, and the two will always go hand in hand in any African meetup. In conclusion, Edmund, I think you should take this one. Rwanda is a very beautiful country. We have a complicated history, but we have such a beautiful, beautiful present, and we have a bright future. So please learn some more about the country and come visit when you get a chance. Everybody's gonna welcome you with open arms. Thank you, Edmund. Stay tuned. The set of triplet countries, the Saint Island countries, are coming up next, starting with the first triplet, St. Kitts and Nevis. Woohoo! Triplets!